Welcome to another podcast of Stories and Innovations in ALS with Lisa Deegan and I'm McFinn Levere at everythingals.org. Welcome to Stories and Innovations in ALS, episode number 11, Dying Out Loud. My name is Lisa Deegan. I'm joined today with McFinn Levere. We are storytellers who have both been affected by ALS. Our mission is to share the journeys of those affected by ALS and also the efforts of those who are investigating and innovating to find a cure for this devastating disease. We're part of an organization called everythingals.org whose mission is care to cure with the ultimate goal of accelerating treatments for ALS. Today, we are excited to have the opportunity to talk with Dave Warnock and Bevan Jett. Dave was diagnosed with ALS in 2019. He's a patient advocate on our Everything ALS team. And Bevan is his partner in crime, um, caregiver extraordinaire. So we're thrilled to have them on this podcast today and also part of Everything ALS as they provide great insight to the ALS journey since who can tell it better than someone going through it. So thank you, Dave and Bevan, for being with us here today. Hey, yes, guys, glad you. to be here. Yeah, to both of you, it's an honor. So let's get down to it. Dave. Yes. What kind of occupation and how old were you when you found out that you had ALS? I was 63. It was February 26th of 2019. I was working in the insurance business. And what was what it, what did you feel as as the first inclination that something was wrong? Yeah. Well, prior to that diagnosis for several months prior to that I'd had symptoms. Um, um, all that year I'd had symptoms in my hands. I was feeling weakness in my hands. I was unable to the insurance forms I was filling out, I was having trouble forming certain numbers and letters. And that was, that was the first sign that something was wrong. I thought it might be carpal tunnel syndrome or something like that. But then I started realizing I couldn't button my buttons very well. And I was having trouble gripping a golf club and picking up a bowling ball and buttoning my pants on a cold winter day, unbuttoning them, almost peed myself trying to get my pants open one day. Mm -hmm. And I, that's those kind of signature moments let me know something was wrong. Was this both hands at the same time or did one start yeah. and then the other follow? This was both oh. at the same time. Yeah, both at the same time. Um, of course, I'm right-handed, so I felt it first in my right hand because that was what I was doing more things with. But as I learned, as I moved forward, um, and this was over the course of six to eight months, it wasn't a rapid development. It was just this troubling bothersome thing that became more and more annoying if you will and so no you didn't go to a doctor until six to eight months after this had and then did you go straight to a neurologist like how did you get diagnosed how did that well you that? know our our health insurance system won't let you do that <laughs> in america we don't really care about sick people um don't get me started on that um i have a i had a i had my own health insurance and so i waited there in my mind, I knew that if I went to see a primary care doctor, which I never went to the doctor, I, I had a PCP assigned to my particular insurance, but I didn't go to doctors for anything. I was completely healthy. So I'd never seen the PCP that was assigned to my particular plan. Okay. Um, but I knew I'd have to start there because insurance requires that you see a PCP first. And then he would refer me to a neurologist or other specialist and they would order tests and tests would lead to more tests. And I knew that that would get very expensive and I would burn through my deductible. I yeah. think my deductible was $2,600. And so I thought, you know what? It's late in the year, 2018. Let me just get through the year and I'll do it in January because then I'll only have one year of deductible. So I had to think in my mind, how much is this going to cost me? Yeah. Now, luckily, as it turns out, it wouldn't have mattered with ALS whether they would have caught it sooner. Because, you know, they, it's not like they could have done something if they had caught it sooner. So it didn't really matter in the long run. But that's why I waited. <clears throat> and then did you, okay, when you started that process, 
did you have to see several doctors? Like, how did it come about where you finally did get your diagnosis? Yeah, I saw um, the PCP and then a neurologist. He, I got, I asked him to refer me to a neurologist because I knew that it was neurological. Mm -hmm. And I was, of course, Googling symptoms and figuring out yeah. what it could be and what it couldn't be. And I thought my best case scenario was what, that it would be a, a pinched nerve of some kind. Yeah. And so I'd seen a neurologist and he, you know, ordered some tests, the uh, uh, EKGs and CAT scans and x-rays and all the things and blood work and all that. And we were trying to rule stuff out. And then uh, an EMG was ordered, mm -hmm. but also I had a schedule, I had scheduled with a neurosurgeon to see if they would determine that it, if, if, if it's something they could repair surgically. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of hoping for that because that's something you can fix. Mm -hmm. But when I did the EMG, uh, the neurologist that did that was a fellow at Vanderbilt. And I asked him, you know, how conclusive are these tests? And he said, they're very conclusive. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, do you get the results immediately in real time? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, I'd rather you just tell me rather than send me home and then call me with a phone call or have me come back in. I just want to know. Yeah. So when it was done, I just said, I looked at him and said, do I have ALS? And he said, yes, you do. Oh. And well, then he Bevan, were you Pardon? there, Bevan, when this happened? No, I was living in Charlotte at the time. Um, and Dave was living in Nashville. So we were kind of long distance at that time. So in fact, mm -hmm. Dave didn't let me know that this was going on. Um, yeah, you could probably tell more of that. Well, we had just gotten to know, we were just getting to know each other. We weren't even a couple at that time. Yeah. Um, we hadn't even spent any time together. And so I was just in Nashville living my life. She was in, here in Charlotte living her life. And I didn't know what was going on. I didn't want to call her and then tell her, hey, I'm getting some tests done. I may be dying, but you still want to hang out? Yeah. <laughs> you still want to date but you know well, I see uh, you're on the fast track now you're living together and so <laughs> well we don't have a lot of time here <laughs> so no I was totally alone actually and I got the diagnosis and he said and we've talked about this before but I think it's important to add when he said you have ALS and I, I, I when I asked him to have ALS he said yes and then he paused a beat and he said I I'm sorry to give you this diagnosis but you have ALS mm. and then he just stopped and I said okay um thank you for telling me should I get dressed now yeah go ahead and get dressed and the elevator's just down the hall to the left oh no follow-up no talk to a counselor no brochure nothing go home and die essentially that's how I felt so I walked home at Vanderbilt was right across I lived really close to Vanderbilt in an apartment I just walked the 30 minutes home and sat there in my apartment and thought, okay, now what do I do next? It was pretty weird. No, Who's the no first person the that you shared this information with, Dave? Um, I think the first person I texted was my best friend, Cass. He, mm -hmm. I had a lot of friends who knew I was getting tested mm -hmm. and were wanting to know, you know, let me know as soon as you know something, that kind of thing. And then later that night, I called my son in New York City and told him. And then I started, you know, sharing with people the diagnosis and that kind of it, it kind of, you know, rapidly uh, became news, if you will. Do you find that most of your friends and family knew what ALS was or were people like, what, no. what is that? Well, yeah, that's a good, good point. When I called my son in New York City, the conversation went like this. Hi, son. Hi, pops. What's up? Well, chit chat. Um, I need to tell you something. I got a diagnosis today. Oh, really? What's that? I have been diagnosed with ALS. And he paused and said, ALS. And I said, Lou Gehrig's disease. And then he said, oh, my God, dad. Oh, my God. So the ALS didn't register. But Lou Gehrig's did. But Lou Gehrig's did. Okay. And he knew what I found that people knew was pretty much what I knew about it. It was okay. bad. It was fatal. It, it was a neurological thing, but we didn't, I didn't, people don't know. They have to do some re. And when they, when they go, oh, you have that. Oh, shit. <laughs> Bevan being in the medical field knew immediately. So when I texted her, mm. she was like, 
whoa, she knew how bad it was. Yeah. Bevan, so tell us your, your role and, and how you've helped. Because one of my questions with, is to everybody is like, tell us about your, your champion who's helped you through this journey. I don't even need to ask Dave that. He He's has who's champion. sitting next to him. He um, is my hero. So, yeah, I mean, you're, you're such a huge part of this. It's like, we, we look at you as, we should call you, um, let's see, Babe or... <laughs> babe. Yeah, we can't do Devin. Or Devin. No, Devin doesn't work. She dated a guy before me a long time called Devit. Oh, well, so that's we gotta, out. We okay, we're going to call you so Babe. Babe is the only it's thing. Like, remember Jennifer, Ben Affleck and yeah. Jennifer. Okay, so we're... <laughs> Uh, anyway, also, also, you see two lovebirds here going through a, a tremendous challenge and they're laughing about it. And that is what true love is. Oh. It is being happy to be with the one you love, no matter what condition yeah. that person is in. Thank you. Yeah. It's Bevin. not easy and it's hard to it's hard to see him go through the things he's having to go through. It's hard to be constantly. I think, I think the maddening thing is just, is just constantly not knowing of what's coming next, when it's coming next, mm -hmm. how to prepare, um, and then not knowing how much to do or not to do for someone and feeling guilty if you're not doing enough. I'll see Dave struggling with something. I won't realize he was struggling. And then I'm feeling like, you know, I'm just horrible. I'm off doing something else and didn't realize he was just trying to open a bag of potato chips or something. And yet at the same time, he doesn't need me constantly. Oh, honey, let me help you open that bag of potato chips. Um, so it's just, it's, and we're kind of in the early stages. So I, I see so many other people struggling so much and, and it comes so fast and furious. I've got a cousin that I mean, people talk about ALS being rare. I guess it's supposed to be, but I have a cousin that got diagnosed with ALS last um, April, well, April, 2020. Oh, and wow. he's just, he's completely impacted now. I mean, he he's can't move arms, legs, talk, just the whole nine yards. And it's just, and he's young. I mean, he's like in his early forties with two very young children. Oh. And I just, you know, I'm not even walking in their shoes right now. And I don't, I can't imagine, you know, how do you prepare for something when it's just every day, something new is hitting. We've actually had a little bit more time because his progression has been significantly slower, but even mm -hmm. right now we're like, wh when do we move? You know, when do we get more adaptive equipment? When, and people are like, well, you want to get this, you know, a few months in advance, but we're like, but we don't know when a few months in advance is. And and some people say, oh, well, it just, you know, it's slow. It's going to stay slow. And other people are like, yeah, it was slow until it fell off the cliff. So mm -hmm. the whole thing is just really scary. And I think a lot of people in my position just feel like we don't know what to do mm -hmm. and when to do it. And There's no manual. There's no manual. And, and every situ every single person is different that we've talked to. Every, every symptom is different. No one, there are no two cases alike. Uh -huh is what we've seen. So we know that we're lucky in that sense. And I'm three years into this and I'm still fairly independent. I can do most things myself. And that's the challenge. You know, I want to have as much independence as I can. So I try to do things and then I get frustrated when I can't do them. And then Bevan comes running and says, let me help you. Let me help you. Why didn't you ask me? And I said, I want to do it myself. And, you know, yeah. there's that whole tug of war there. Um, you too sound so positive, but Dave, what happens have you had a depression and and been able to come? I know you've been able to come out of it if you have it, but what do you do when you get depressed about this? Good question. Scream and curse, she said. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I uh I think I have had low moments where I'm, and they're usually more frustrating than sad. They're like, damn it, why can't I, you know, I just want to be able to. You know, after five minutes of trying to screw a cap on something and just finally, you know, just realizing, my God, why is this so hard? Um, but it's just momentary um, frustration points. It's mm -hmm. not like a low depression where I can't get out of bed and 
And I'm, I'm, I, I just really, I don't know if it's just a personality trait or what, but that's just not how I'm wired. I don't go there. I'm more like, I'll have a burst of anger at a frustration, not even anger at having ALS, but just anger or frustration with a, a certain thing that, I, that I'm having trouble with. And it passes quickly and I just move on about my day. I've got a lot of things that I'm busy with every day and that keeps me focused, that keeps me motivated, that gets me up every day. And so that, that I think is a key to not giving into depression is just having stuff, being busy, having stuff to do that I think is important to do. And that's what gets me up and going every day. Well, that's I a can great so, tip. That is a great tip. And I can so relate because my brother, we didn't know what to prepare for, when to prepare, what to expect. Every month there was a new stage, whether it was something not nearly, not just, you know, losing, you know, his independence, but a new stage of something emotionally we had to navigate or a new frustration. Um, so I, I will say I found being prepared would have been less stressful for me as a caregiver in helping him, but he also didn't want to face needing certain things. I don't want, I don't need that. I don't want that. So mm -hmm. getting to the chair was huge. He walked until he literally fell on a marble sculpture, split his head open and went to the ER. He was so stubborn, but you know, we had to let him go through all of that because he wanted to walk as long as he could. And so it's a hard balance, Bevan, I understand of being there, but also letting them dictate and letting them still feel in charge and having control. Yeah. I, I, I totally understand it's all that. It's a tough that. balancing act because the, I know that those, most of us, probably especially men, don't want to have to have stuff done for us and we want our independence and our freedom mm -hmm. and that's me i want to do stuff as long as i can i don't want to because i know once i give it up i'm not getting it back once i quit driving i won't drive again yeah. and you know i've been driving for a lot of years and and so that's a milestone i really don't want to pass i hear you buddy i drove to the store for the last time because i wanted to see people and when I drove my truck back home, I couldn't turn the wheel to get to the to the, my drive. And I mm -hmm. felt so guilty about being out on the road. But I I had to one more time. <laughs> I understand. So what do I want to ask? What what have you I mean, there's so many things that you learn and process as you're going through this. You guys are already such positive, like people with such like, you know, insight on so much. So I feel a little bit silly asking you this, but I still like to ask people, what have, what have you learned or gained through this experience? Because I, I still think we all take something new away from every experience, no matter what it is. So what, what would you say? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I'll go first and then Bevan can tag off of it because what has developed after my, after my diagnosis, I was, I quickly retired from the insurance business and my instinct was to live as much life as I could live until I couldn't do anything and then, you know, hang it up. So I wanted to travel. I wanted to do some things while I still could, because I didn't know if I had a year or two years, I was only interested in the quality of time I had left, not the quantity. And so I wanted to focus on getting out and doing things as much as I could. And I didn't care, you know, if I burned through the money I had, if I ran up credit card bills, I didn't care. I was just going to live life and let someone else deal with the credit card bills. It wasn't going to, I wasn't going to worry about it. And um, cause I just didn't know. I, I didn't know. I didn't know my, that was my instinct, but what developed was the thing that we call dying out loud. And coming from the background I came from, I was an evangelical Christian most of my adult life and a pastor many of those years and then about a dozen years ago I deconverted from that and, and I'm, I now re uh, identify as an atheist and that journey um, changed my worldview and changed the way I look at life and death obviously because I used to look at death as just a 
stepping stone into eternity. Now I look at death as that's it. There's nothing behind the curtain. And so that changes then. For me, it changed how I look at life. And so when I started, I started getting, uh, I had a friend who became a manager for me and she started booking me on podcasts like this and YouTube shows and speaking engagements. And, the, and we were traveling all over the country, literally all over the world before COVID mm -hmm. and speaking at secular events and you know, universalist churches and all kinds of venues to groups large and small about living and dying. And, and I started talking about dealing with a terminal illness through the eyes of an atheist uh, in comparison to my former view as a Christian. And I started talking about living your best moments and grabbing everything you can out of life and looking at it head on and not being afraid of death and all of those, those topics. And I think my takeaway when you ask me what, what I've learned from it is that people are not afraid to talk about those things if someone will lead them into that conversation. And I started hearing from people literally all over the world who would see me on a podcast or something and reach out to me and tell me how my message was inspiring them and giving them hope and giving them um, positive, positive thoughts and, and a willingness to attack life. A woman who was depressed saying, I would never leave my house. And now I walked five miles today because if you can do it, Dave, I can do it. Uh -huh. I just was blown away when I started getting all these messages and it just, I realized that people are afraid of death because no one's talking about it. Mm -hmm. And if we talk about it and talking about the life that we have now and making the most of it, it takes the fear of death away for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it really surprised me the response I got out of that. And it's been a gratifying life-changing experience for me. And when I say, you know, that's what gets me up every day and gets me going. I have so much to do every day with that. And it's, it's the thing that motivates and Bevan helps in that. And, and she's such a vital part in coordinating things and scheduling things and communicating with people. And we just, we, we had to ship a, a bracelet that we have some bracelets that come up. We shipped a bracelet to Sweden this oh. week. Um, and last week one to Ber Germany. And, you know, it's not an easy thing. You get under the post office and Bevan's coming home from the hospital. She's there all night and I can't fill the form out because I can't write. So we're, we're trying to figure out how do we get this done? But it was important because the woman in Sweden says, your bracelet reminds me to focus on what's important. And it just blows me away. Well, you guys are driven with purpose. Huh? purpose. You're driven with purpose. Mm -hmm. and your past gave you the tools what you've done in you know your past with your preaching and then mm -hmm. becoming atheist and what you learned from that experience obviously gave you the tools to handle what you're going through now and you're you're still giving to others throughout all this which yeah. is amazing it's been it's been a, a incredible journey it's um having help in it i mean you you talk about you know, what, what, what you've, okay. The question was, what have we learned in this process? What, what would you say you've taken out mostly in this? I mean, from the first so time. So many, so many things. I mean, just well, one, um, although I knew what ALS was as a disease, I had not had firsthand experience with it. And now because of Dave have gotten to know a lot of people with ALS and it's just, all ages, just anybody. And, and it's just like, there's this group of people that are not being focused on, that are not being helped. And it's because it's not a large enough number to have a major impact mm -hmm. on everyone else. And so it's not enough to get government funding for it. It's not enough to get enough research money for it. It's not enough to solve it. And so it just keeps going on and on. And it it just blows me away with all the advances that we have in medicine and technology and everything that we are just, people go, oh, we're closer, we're closer, but we still aren't really that close yet. 
Um, we've got all these trials and yet they show time after time after time again, these things aren't working the way we wanted them to work. And one of the reasons I was very excited about um, everything ALS is everything ALS is saying, we can't even get some things approved because we don't have the right biomarkers to show that they do work. And that's, that's insane. I mean, we need to have that. And yeah. That's one of the focuses of everything ALS. And so and talk about a Roberto and Shelley in Costa Rica and as far the as frustration of the neuron thing. Well, we saw our, the neuron trial, we saw it help a good friend of ours yep. significantly. It yep. really paused his symptoms for almost a year and then he couldn't get more because the trial was over and and the FDA oh. denied, denied it. He was cr he was crushed. He yep. was he saw them in Costa Rica shortly after that. And the last time we had seen him was in Minnesota a couple of years before, and he was he was doing great. And and then in Costa Rica, he's he's can't he's in a wheelchair. He can't move his arms. He's depressed. It's just it was tragic. And it's just we knew that drug helped him. We knew it that. helped thirty five percent of the people, which is better than zero. We saw that. Well, that's it a, helped those, better those than zero. Those 35% of the people were people in the early stages. Yeah. And that is where he was. And now, now he's too far gone. And it helped. Helped. And they actually did, when they didn't get approved, they contacted some of the people that had success, put them in another trial or whatever, and gave them, it's not working the same way. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it didn't show in the studies that it worked the same way if you had progressed. So yeah. it's... It's just a lot of things that are frustrating. That was a very difficult trial. It was a 50% placebo to be getting spinal, you know, lumbar punctures. Uh, we don't need a 50% placebo. Yeah. Um, just a lot of things that need to be corrected as far as with the, um, with that. And then, and as far as just wanting, just wanting to be able to give people some sense of, of hope that, that effort is being made, but I just see so many people that feel like it's not worth it or there's not enough time because this typically takes people within three to five years. Um, people in three years are very rarely like Dave. I mean, Dave is like, and in, in just look at the data is really in the five to 10% category. Mm -hmm. and, and so it just breaks my heart. It just breaks my heart. Um, so. And we just, we, we have a, we just have the, the feeling that with biomarkers, if we'd have been ahead of the game, if we, if, if Neuron had had what we're doing now with everything yeah. ALS and getting the biomarkers and having that data, then it would have been a different story with that trial and, and with the people in that trial. And to know someone personally that we've seen affected by that is just crushing. Yeah. And I, I, I just, we, this, this work we're doing is so important. Yeah. Uh, well, can you share with us what, you know, because we're so excited to have both of you um, on our team and you guys provide so much great insight. Like I mentioned earlier, can you share with our listeners how you guys um, are going to be participating with our group and like what roles you're going to take on? Yeah, go ahead. Well, the big one is to <laughs> encourage people to be part of a biomarker <laughs> event as far as with our speech study. Um, mm -hmm. That is um, ongoing right now. Um, I think a lot of people are confused in that they think it's gonna require time or they think that they don't qualify to be part of it because they don't have ALS. But Dave and I are in it because it's basically 10 minutes a week, maybe 20 minutes if you're having some speech difficulty, but um, just basically speaking out loud to your computer or to your phone um, and they register both facial movements and, and your voice to be able to get biomarkers for people with ALS versus people that don't have ALS. And when we get these, we'll be able to use these in future studies as far as the speech patterns um, to be able to tell if like drugs are working or even maybe to see if people um, have a probability of, of they may be getting ALS. So there's just a lot of benefit to that. And everything ALS is doing something that we haven't seen before. And that is to be able to get a huge um, pool of people. And they're looking for a thousand people. I think we're up to 600 something right now, but um, to have people sign up for that. And it's just really, it's just easy to do. You just, you just go to everything ALS website and there's a research button. You click on that and it walks you through and how to sign up for it. But 
um, you know, so many people are like, you know, how can we donate? You know, what can we do? And I'm like, just do the speech study. It doesn't even cost you anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that would be a, a wonderful way to be able to help everyone right now and in the future. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. So we're working on that. Our, our role on the team, I think, is to help with that. And then as well as to be a, a voice on the team that is someone who currently is dealing with ALS as a PALS and a CALS. So that, you know, that because I think pretty much everyone on the team, even except my fan, you, you were ALS and now you're not, but. And now we have Austin who has. And Austin, you know, yeah, Austin has come on recently, but, yeah. you know, just you, you guys all experienced it having lost someone and, and are working diligently on the research end of things. And then mm-hmm. to have voices from those of us still in the trenches is, is an important element. And I think that's crucial, a big part of why we're here. It's crucial. And so we're so glad to have you guys on board. And you guys are such a strong team together. And you keep us uplifted because sometimes we all need a little push up. You know, it's it's hard work and it's it's frustrating sometimes. So you guys always come in with a smile. So whenever I see you guys, I smile because <laughs> okay. you're so hey, Dave, cute. Did yes, you um, did you apply for Social Security disability? I did. Yes, I got that. Um, it's funny, you know, I, I used to, I worked in the insurance field and I did a lot of Medicare business and that, that there was always, I, I knew because I'd fill these forms out hundreds of times for clients that uh, ALS qualified you for immediate social security benefits. And yet I didn't even think to apply for it myself when I got diagnosed. Uh, well, you probably are so overwhelmed thinking I about everything. Thinking, oh, I got to get Medicare, you know, and then I, when I yeah. get 65, I'll get Medicare. Then I said, wait a minute, I qualify yeah. now. That's right. That's right. So, a lot of people yeah, don't know I that. Did. So I'm glad you mentioned you know, it, that. It's an important distinction. And, and I've helped a few people since then in these, on these groups that we're in, you know, to, to remind them that you, you qualify immediately for Medicare. And it's a big deal for a lot of people to have that. It is a big deal because if you um, are under 65 and you mm-hmm. apply for that, they give you, like I was 55 when I applied, they gave me the amount of money that I would get at 66. So they gave me a full extra $500 a month because yeah. of social security disability. So that's why I ask people, have you applied? Right. So super important. Thank you mm-hmm. for, for finally doing that. But we want to remind everybody, once you have ALS, you get that diagnosis, you need to apply. Because sometimes yeah. it takes up to uh, five months for them to process. To get that. approved. Yeah. We should probably mention that at. Uh, from time to time in our in our uh, webinars, just yeah, as a reminder yeah, not time. a bad idea. Why don't you guys? Yeah, uh, step right, in. Might mean I will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Because well, that I, extra I also... money they give it to you for the rest of your life. Right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Big deal. It is a big deal. So, do either of you guys? We have about four minutes left, and I want to make sure um, if you guys want to share any advice you would give to somebody going through the journey, listening to this, um, you know, any advice about anything with ALS? Obviously we talked about a lot of different things, but um, anything you wanna add? Well, I think one of the things when I, when this first happened, I was like you, I was trying to get advice from other people and, Mm -hmm. and people that had ALS. And one thing I kept hearing was, I wish I had known that, you know, I wasn't going to be in basically live for the moment. You know, I wish I had lived more and not stopped worrying about what was going to happen. It's going to happen. There's no way to avoid that at the moment, but to just live for what we have right now and to really enjoy life right now. And so um, Dave and I just sort of kind of plan full steam ahead. We don't sit there and go, well, maybe we shouldn't plan that trip because you might not be very mobile now. And my attitude is, if that's the case, we'll readjust or we'll cancel, but let's just go ahead and plan it and, and just really live for today because that, that's all we have. I mean, that's mm-hmm. all everybody has. That's all we all have. So yeah. that's good advice. 
Yeah, and I've I've said it this way: the day that I stop making plans is the day I start dying. Yeah. And so it is important for me to have stuff on my calendar, to have stuff that I'm re reaching forward toward and looking forward to. Um, having it, it again, it's that motivation. And mm -hmm. the other balance that can be hard to strike is the difference between spending your time and energy staying alive and spending your time and energy living. Oh, that's good. Two vastly different things. A lot of people in this community get caught up in chasing after this and chasing after that and looking for this doctor and that medication and this treatment and that potion. And all of their energy is spent on the idea that they can stay alive longer. And in doing that, they, they're not doing any living. And I'm, I'm I, writing that I, down. I love it. I decided early on that I wanted to focus on living instead of staying alive. Now that said, I will take the stuff and do the stuff I can. Bevan gives me a, a pocket full of pills every day and I take them. <laughs> I don't know what they are. She could be poisoning me. I have no idea. Sentinel. <laughs> but, but I take whatever she gives me. And I want to do everything I can. I'm in a study right now, in a clinical study, and I'm going to do everything I can to stay alive. But my focus, my energy, my drive mm -hmm. is about living and not so much that I'm not trying to pull every day out of this life. I'm trying to make sure that the days I have are good days. Folks, information like that is priceless, no matter what kind of disease or no disease. So thank you to both of you for your inspiration, Bevan, for your care for Dave, Dave, for your care for Bevan, because it goes both ways. Thank you. Two lovebirds on a journey together. We're glad that we're on that journey with you too. So thank you again for your time, your inspiration, and the love that comes right through that camera. Let's see another hug. Oh. <laughs> that was Beautiful. You. Thank you, guys. Thanks for joining us in our journey of exploration and digging deep into the souls of those affected by ALS and those working tirelessly to help put an end to this devastating disease. Your stories and work matter so much to us and to so many. Keep sharing and continuing to help further the research in ALS so we don't have to see another person suffer. Do you know anyone suffering from ALS? Are you a researcher, neurologist, pharma, or biotech company working in the ALS space? If so, we would love to hear from you. Contact us at info at everythingals.org. Thank you, folks. Thank you.